section seven of common sense in the household this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b common sense in the household a manual of practical housewifery by marion harland shellfish to boil a lobster choose a lively one not too large lest he should be tough put a handful of salt into a pot of boiling water and having tied the claws together if your fish merchant has not already skewered them plunge him into the prepared bath he will be restive under this vigorous hydropathic treatment but allay your tortured sympathies by the reflection that he is a cold-blooded animal destitute of imagination and that pain according to some philosophers exists only in the imagination however this may be his suffering will be short-lived boil from half an hour to an hour as his size demands when done draw out the scarlet innocent and lay him face downward in a sieve to dry when cold split open the body and tail and crack the claws to extract the meat throwing away the lady fingers and the head lobsters are seldom served without dressing upon private tables as few persons care to take the trouble of preparing their own salad after taking their seats at the board deviled lobster extract the meat from a boiled lobster as for salad and mince it finely reserve the coral season highly with mustard cayenne salt and some pungent sauce toss and stir until it is well mixed and put into a porcelain saucepan covered with just enough hot water to keep it from burning rub the coral smooth moistening with vinegar until it is thin enough to pour easily then stir into the contents of the saucepan it is necessary to prepare the dressing let me say before the lobster meat is set on the fire it ought to boil up but once before the coral and vinegar are put in next stir in a heaping tablespoonful of butter and when it boils again take the pan from the fire too much cooking toughens the meat this is a famous supper dish for sleighing parties lobster croquettes to the meat of a well-boiled lobster chopped fine add pepper salt and powdered mace mix with this one quarter as much bread crumbs well rubbed as you have meat make into ovates or pointed balls with two tablespoonfuls of melted butter roll these in beaten egg then in pulverized cracker and fry in butter or very nice sweet lard serve dry and hot and garnish with crisp parsley this is a delicious supper dish or entree at dinner deviled crab this is prepared according to the receipt for deviled lobster substituting for the coral in the vinegar some pulverized cracker moistened first with a tablespoonful of rich cream you can serve up in the back shell of the crab if you like send in with cream crackers and stick a sprig of parsley in the top of each heap ranging the shells upon a large flat dish crab salad mince the meat and dress as in lobster salad send in the back shell of the crab soft crabs many will not eat hard shell crabs considering them indigestible and not sufficiently palatable to compensate for the risk they run in eating them and it must be owned that they are at their best but an indifferent substitute for the more aristocratic lobster but in the morning of life for him so often renewed his crabship is a different creature and greatly affected by epicures do not keep the crabs over night as the shells harden in twenty-four hours pull off the spongy substance from the sides and the sandbags these are the only portions that are uneatable wash well and wipe dry have ready a pan of seething hot lard or butter and fry them to a fine brown put a little salt into the lard the butter will need none send up hot garnished with parsley water turtles or terrapins land terrapins it is hardly necessary to say are uneatable but the large turtle that frequents our mill ponds and rivers can be converted into a relishable article of food plunge the turtle into a pot of boiling water and let him lie there for five minutes you can then skin the under part easily and pull off the horny parts of the feet lay him for ten minutes in cold salt and water 
then put into more hot water salted but not too much boil until tender the time will depend upon the size and age take him out drain and wipe dry loosen the shell carefully not to break the flesh cut open also with care lest you touch the gall bag with the knife remove this with the entrails and sand bag cut up all the rest of the animal into small bits season with pepper salt a chopped onion sweet herbs and a teaspoonful of some spiced sauce or a tablespoonful of ketchup walnut or mushroom save the juice that runs from the meat and put all together into a saucepan with a closely fitting top stew gently fifteen minutes stirring occasionally and add a great spoonful of butter a tablespoonful of browned flour wet in cold water a glass of brown sherry and lastly the beaten yolk of an egg mixed with a little of the hot liquor that it may not curdle boil up once and turn into a covered dish send around green pickles and delicate slices of dry toast with it stewed oysters drain the liquor from two quarts of firm plump oysters mix with it a small teacupful of hot water add a little salt and pepper and set over the fire in a saucepan let it boil up once put in the oysters let them boil for five minutes or less not more when they ruffle add two tablespoonfuls of butter the instant it is melted and well stirred in put in a large cupful of boiling milk and take the saucepan from the fire serve with oyster or cream crackers as soon as possible oysters become tough and tasteless when cooked too much or left to stand too long after they are withdrawn from the fire fried oysters use for frying the largest and best oysters you can find take them carefully from the liquor lay them in rows upon a clean cloth and press another lightly upon them to absorb the moisture have ready some crackers crushed fine in the frying pan heat enough nice butter to cover the oysters entirely dip each oyster into the cracker rolling it over so that it may become completely encrusted drop them carefully into the frying pan and fry quickly to a light brown if the butter is hot enough they will soon be ready to take out test it by putting in one oyster before you risk the rest do not let them lie in the pan an instant after they are done serve dry and let the dish be warm a chafing dish is best oyster fritters drain the liquor from the oysters and to a cupful of this add the same quantity of milk three eggs a little salt and flour enough for a thin batter chop the oysters and stir into the batter have ready in the frying pan a few spoonfuls of lard or half lard half butter heat very hot and drop the oyster batter in by the tablespoonful try a spoonful first to satisfy yourself that the lard is hot enough and that the fritter is of the right size and consistency take rapidly from the pan as soon as they are done to a pleasing yellow brown and send to table very hot some fry the oyster whole enveloped in batter one in each fritter in this case the batter should be thicker than if the chopped oysters were to be added scalloped oysters crush and roll several handfuls of boston or other friable crackers put a layer in the bottom of a buttered pudding dish wet this with a mixture of the oyster liquor and milk slightly warmed next have a layer of oysters sprinkle with salt and pepper and lay small bits of butter upon them then another layer of moistened crumbs and so on until the dish is full let the top layer be of crumbs thicker than the rest and beat an egg into the milk you pour over them stick bits of butter thickly over it cover the dish set it in the oven bake half an hour if the dish be large remove the cover and brown by setting it upon the upper grating of oven or by holding a hot shovel over it broiled oysters choose large fat oysters wipe them very dry sprinkle salt and cayenne pepper upon them and broil upon one of the small gridirons sold for that purpose you can dredge the oyster with cracker dust or flour if you wish to have it brown and some fancy the juices are better kept in this way others dislike the crust thus formed butter the gridiron well and let your fire be hot and clear if the oyster drip withdraw the gridiron for an instant until the smoke clears away broil quickly and dish hot putting a tiny piece of butter not larger than a pea upon each oyster 
cream oysters on the half shell pour into your inner saucepan a cup of hot water another of milk and one of cream with a little salt set into a kettle of hot water until it boils when stir in two tablespoonfuls of butter and a little salt with white pepper take from the fire and add two heaping tablespoonfuls of arrowroot rice flour or cornstarch wet with cold milk by this time your shells should be washed and buttered and a fine oyster laid within each of course it is selon les règles to use oyster shells for this purpose but you will find clam shells more roomy and manageable because more regular in shape range these closely in a large baking pan propping them with clean pebbles or fragments of shell if they do not seem inclined to retain their contents stir the cream very hard and fill up each shell with a spoon taking care not to spill any in the pan bake five or six minutes in a hot oven after the shells become warm serve on the shell some substitute oyster liquor for the water in the mixture and use all milk instead of cream oyster omelet twelve oysters if large double the number of small ones six eggs one cup milk one tablespoonful butter chopped parsley salt and pepper chop the oysters very fine beat the yolks and whites of the eggs separately as for nice cake the white until it stands in a heap put three tablespoonfuls of butter in a frying pan and heat while you are mixing the omelet stir the milk into a deep dish with the yolk and season next put in the chopped oysters beating vigorously as you add them gradually when they are thoroughly incorporated pour in the spoonful of melted butter finally whip in the whites lightly and with as few strokes as possible if the butter is hot and it ought to be that the omelet may not stand uncooked put the mixture into the pan do not stir it but when it begins to stiffen to set in culinary phrase slip a broad bladed round pointed dinner knife around the sides and cautiously under the omelet that the butter may reach every part as soon as the center is fairly set turn out into a hot dish lay the latter bottom upward over the frying pan which must be turned upside down dexterously this brings the brown side of the omelet uppermost this omelet is delicious and easily made oyster pie make a rich puff paste roll out twice as thick as for a fruit pie for the top crust about the ordinary thickness for the lower line a pudding dish with the thinner and fill with crusts of dry bread or light crackers some use a folded towel to fill the interior of the pie but the above expedient is preferable butter the edges of the dish that you may be able to lift the upper crust without breaking cover the mock pie with the thick crust ornamented heavily at the edge that it may lie the more quietly and bake cook the oysters as for a stew only beating into them at the last two eggs and thickening with a spoonful of fine cracker crumbs or rice flour they should stew but five minutes and time them so that the paste will be baked just in season to receive them lift the top crust pour in the smoking hot oysters and send up hot i know that many consider it unnecessary to prepare the oysters and crust separately but my experience and observation go to prove that if this precaution be omitted the oysters are apt to be woefully overdone the reader can try both methods and take her choice pickled oysters one hundred large oysters one pint white wine vinegar one dozen blades of mace two dozen whole cloves two dozen whole black peppers one large red pepper broken into bits put oysters liquor and all into a porcelain or bell metal kettle salt to taste heat slowly until the oysters are very hot but not to boiling take them out with a perforated skimmer and set aside to cool to the liquor which remains in the kettle add the vinegar and spices boil up fairly and when the oysters are almost cold pour over them scalding hot cover the jar in which they are and put away in a cool place next day put the pickled oysters into glass cans with tight tops keep in the dark and where they are not liable to become heated i have kept oysters thus prepared for three weeks in the winter if you open a can use the contents up as soon as practicable the air like the light will turn them dark 
it is little trouble for every housekeeper to put up the pickled oysters needed in her family and besides the satisfaction she will feel in the consciousness that the materials used are harmless and the oysters sound she will save at least one-third of the price of those she would buy ready pickled the colorless vinegar used by professionals for such purposes is usually sulfuric or pyroligneous acid if you doubt this pour a little of the liquor from the pickled oysters put up by your obliging oyster dealer into a bell metal kettle i tried it once and the result was a liquid that matched the clear green of niagara in hue roast oysters there is no pleasanter frolic for an autumn evening in the regions where oysters are plentiful than an impromptu roast in the kitchen there the oysters are hastily thrown into the fire by the peck you may consider that your fastidious taste is marvelously respected if they are washed first a bushel basket is set to receive the empty shells and the click of the oyster knives forms a constant accompaniment to the music of laughing voices nor are roast oysters amiss upon your own quiet supper table when the good man comes in on a wet night tired and hungry and wants something heartening wash and wipe the shell oysters and lay them in the oven if it is quick upon the top of the stove if it is not when they are open they are done pile in a large dish and send to table remove the upper shell by a dexterous wrench of the knife season the oyster on the lower with pepper sauce and butter or pepper salt and vinegar in lieu of the sauce and you have the very aroma of this pearl of bivalves pure and undefiled or you may open while raw leaving the oysters upon the lower shells lay in a large baking pan and roast in their own liquor adding pepper salt and butter before serving raw oysters it is fashionable to serve these as one of the preliminaries to a dinner party sometimes in small plates sometimes on the half shell they are seasoned by each guest according to his own taste steamed oysters if you have no steamer improvise one by the help of a colander and a pot lid fitting closely into it at a little distance from the top wash some shell oysters and lay them in such a position in the bottom of the colander that the liquor will not escape from them when the shell opens that is with the upper shell down cover with a cloth thrown over the top of the colander and press the lid hard down upon this to exclude the air set over a pot of boiling water so deep that the colander which should fit into the mouth does not touch the water boil hard for twenty minutes then make a hasty examination of the oysters if they are open you are safe in removing the cover serve on the half shell or upon a hot chafing dish sprinkle a little salt over them and a few bits of butter but be quick in whatever you do for the glory of the steamed oyster is to be eaten hot oyster pates one quart oysters two tablespoonfuls of butter pepper and a pinch of salt set the oysters with enough liquor to cover them in a saucepan upon the range or stove let them come to a boil skim well and stir in the butter and seasoning two or three spoonfuls of cream will improve them have ready small tins lined with puff paste put three or four oysters in each according to the size of the pate cover with paste and bake in a quick oven twenty minutes for open pates cut the paste into round cakes those intended for the bottom crust less than an eighth of an inch thick for the upper a little thicker with a smaller cutter remove a round of paste from the middle of the latter leaving a neat ring lay this carefully upon the bottom crust place a second ring upon this that the cavity may be deep enough to hold the oysters lay the pieces you have extracted also in the pan with the rest and bake to a fine brown in a quick oven when done wash over with beaten egg a round top and all and set in the oven three minutes to glaze fill the cavity with a mixture prepared as below fit on the top lightly and serve mixture boil half the liquor from a quart of oysters put in all the oysters leaving out the uncooked liquor heat to boiling and stir in one half cup of hot milk one tablespoonful butter two tablespoonfuls cornstarch wet with a little milk a little salt boil four minutes stirring all the time until it thickens 
and fill the cavity in the paste shells these pates are very nice scallops the heart is the only part used if you buy them in the shell boil and take out the hearts those sold in our markets are generally ready for frying or stewing dip them in beaten egg then in cracker crumbs and fry in hot lard or you may stew like oysters the fried scallops are generally preferred scalloped clams chop the clams fine and season with pepper and salt cayenne pepper is thought to give a finer flavor than black or white but to some palates it is insufferable mix in another dish some powdered cracker moisten first with warm milk then with the clam liquor a beaten egg or two and some melted butter stir in with this the chopped clams wash as many clam shells as the mixture will fill wipe and butter them fill heaping up and smoothing over with a silver knife or teaspoon range in rows in your baking pan and cook until nicely browned or if you do not care to be troubled with the shells bake in patty pans sending to table hot in the tins as you would in the scallop shells clam fritters twelve clams minced fine one pint of milk three eggs add the liquor from the clams to the milk beat up the eggs and put to this with salt and pepper and flour enough for thin batter lastly the chopped clams fry in hot lard trying a little first to see that fat and batter are right a tablespoonful will make a fritter of moderate size or you can dip the whole clams in batter and cook in like manner fry quickly or they are apt to be too greasy clam chowder fry five or six slices of fat pork crisp and chopped to pieces sprinkle some of these in the bottom of a pot lay upon them a stratum of clams sprinkle with cayenne or black pepper and salt and scatter bits of butter profusely over all next have a layer of chopped onions then one of small crackers split and moisten with warm milk on these pour a little of the fat left in the pan after the pork is fried and then comes a new round of pork clams onion etc proceed in this order until the pot is nearly full when cover with water and stew slowly the pot closely covered for three quarters of an hour drain off all the liquor that will flow freely and when you have turned the chowder into the tureen return the gravy to the pot thicken with flour or better still pounded crackers add a glass of wine some ketchup and spiced sauce boil up and pour over the contents of the tureen send around walnut or butternut pickles with it end of section seven section eight of common sense in the household this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by jude summers common sense in the household a manual of practical housewifery by marion harland section eight poultry poultry should never be eaten in less than six or eight hours after it is killed it should be picked and drawn as soon as possible there is no direr disgrace to our northern markets than the practice of sending whole dead fowls to market i have bought such from responsible poultry dealers and found them uneatable from having remained undrawn until the flavor of the craw and intestines has impregnated the whole body those who are conversant with the habit of careful country housewives of keeping up a fowl without food for a day or night before killing and dressing for their own eating cannot but regard with disgust the surcharged crops and puffy sides of those sold by weight in the shambles if you want to know what you really pay for poultry bought in these circumstances weigh the offal extracted from the fowl by your cook and deduct from the market weight but don't you know it actually poisons a fowl to lie so long undressed once exclaimed a southern lady to me in our markets they are offered for sale ready picked and drawn with the giblets also cleaned tucked under their wings i know nothing about the poisonous nature of the entrails and crops i do assert that the custom is unclean and unjust 
and this I do without the remotest hope of arousing my fellow housekeepers to remonstrance against established usage. Only it relieves my mind somewhat to grumble at what I cannot help. The best remedy I can propose for the grievance is to buy live fowls, and, before sending them home, ask your butcher to decapitate them the probabilities being greatly in favor of the supposition that your cook is too tender-hearted to attempt the job. One word as to the manner of roasting meats and fowls. In this day of ranges and cooking stoves, I think I am speaking within bounds when I assume that not one housekeeper in fifty uses a spit, or even a tin kitchen for such purposes. It is in vain that the writers of recipe books inform us with refreshing naivete that all our meats are baked, not roasted, and expatiate upon the superior flavor of those prepared upon the English spits, and in old-fashioned kitchens, where enormous wood fires blazed from morning until night. I shall not soon forget my perplexity when an inexperienced housekeeper and a firm believer in all that was writ by older and wiser people, I stood before my neat Mott's defiance, a fine sirloin of beef ready to be cooked on the table behind me, and read from my instruction book that my fire should extend at least eight inches beyond the roaster on either side of the spit. I am not denying the virtues of spits and tin kitchens, only regretting that they are not within the reach of every one. In view of this fact, let me remark, for the benefit of the unfortunate many, that, in the opinion of excellent judges, the practice of roasting meat in close ovens has advantages. Of these I need mention but two, to wit, the preservation of the flavor of the article roasted, and the prevention of its escape to the upper regions of the dwelling. Roast Turkey After drawing the turkey, rinse out with several waters, and in next to the last, mix a teaspoonful of soda. The inside of a fowl, especially if purchased in the market, is sometimes very sour, and imparts an unpleasant taste to the stuffing, if not to the inner part of the legs and side bones. The soda will act as a corrective, and is moreover very cleansing. Fill the body with this water, shake well, empty it out, and rinse with fair water. Then prepare a dressing of bread crumbs mixed with butter, pepper, salt, thyme, or sweet margarine. You may, if you like, add the beaten yolks of two eggs. A little chopped sausage is esteemed an improvement when well incorporated with the other ingredients or mince a dozen oysters, and stir into the dressing. The effect upon the turkey meat, particularly that of the breast, is very pleasant. Stuff the craw with this, and tie a string tightly about the neck, to prevent the escape of the stuffing. Then fill the body of the turkey, and sew it up with strong thread. This and the neck string are to be removed when the fowl is dished. In roasting, if your fire is brisk, Allow about ten minutes to a pound, but it will depend very much upon the turkey's age whether this rule holds good. Dredge it with flour before roasting, and baste often, at first with butter and water, afterward with the gravy in the dripping pan. If you lay the turkey in the pan, put in with it a teacup of hot water. Many roast always upon a grating placed on the top of the pan. In that case, the boiling water steams the under part of the fowl, and prevents the skin from drying too fast, or cracking. Roast to a fine brown, and if it threaten to darken too rapidly, lay a sheet of white paper over it, until the lower part is also done. Stew the chopped giblets in just enough water to cover them, and when the turkey is lifted from the pan, add these, with the water in which they were boiled, to the drippings. Thicken with a spoonful of browned flour, wet with cold water to prevent lumping, boil up once, and pour into the gravy boat. If the turkey is fat, skim the drippings well before putting in the giblets. Serve with cranberry sauce. Some lay fried oysters in the dish around the turkey. Boiled Turkey 
chop about two dozen oysters and mix with them a dressing compounded as for the turkey only with more butter stuff the turkey as for the roasting craw and body and baste about it a thin cloth fitted closely to every part the inside of the cloth should be dredged with flour to prevent the fowl from sticking to it allow fifteen minutes to a pound and boil slowly serve with oyster sauce made by adding to a cupful of the liquor in which the turkey was boiled eight oysters chopped fine season with minced parsley stir in a spoonful of rice or wheat flour wet with cold milk a tablespoon of butter add a cupful of hot milk boil up once and pour into an oyster tureen send around celery with it turkey scallop cut the meat from the bones of a cold boiled or roasted turkey left from yesterday's dinner remove the bits of skin and gristle and chop up the rest very fine put in the bottom of a buttered dish a layer of cracker or bread crumbs moisten slightly with milk that they may not absorb all the gravy to be poured in afterward then spread a layer of the minced turkey with bits of the stuffing pepper salt and small pieces of butter another layer of cracker wet with milk and so on until the dish is nearly full before putting on the topmost layer pour in the gravy left from the turkey diluted should there not be enough with hot water and seasoned with worcestershire sauce or ketchup and butter have ready a crust of cracker crumbs soaked in warm milk seasoned with salt and beaten up light with two eggs it should be just thick enough to spread smoothly over the top of the scallop stick bits of butter plentiful upon it and bake turn a deep plate over the dish until the contents begin to bubble at the sides showing that the whole is thoroughly cooked then remove the cover and brown a large pudding dish full of the mixture will be cooked in three quarters of an hour this like many other economical dishes will prove so savory as to claim a frequent appearance upon any table cold chicken may be prepared in the same way or the minced turkey dressing and cracker crumbs may be wet with gravy two eggs beaten into it and the force meat thus made rolled into oblong shapes dipped in egg and pounded cracker and fried like croquettes for a side dish to make out a dinner of ham or cold meat ragout of turkey this is also a cheap yet nice dish cut the cold turkey from the bones and into bits an inch long with a knife and fork tearing as little as possible put into a skillet or saucepan the gravy left from the roast with hot water to dilute it should the quantity be small add a lump of butter the size of an egg a teaspoon of pungent sauce a large pinch of nutmeg with a little salt let it boil and put in the meat stew very slowly for ten minutes not more and stir in a tablespoonful of cranberry or currant jelly another of browned flour which has been wet with cold water lastly a glass of brown sherry or madeira boil up once and serve in a covered dish for breakfast leave out the stuffing entirely it is no improvement to the flavor and disfigures the appearance of the ragout roast chickens having picked and drawn them wash out well in two or three waters adding a little soda to the last one should any doubtful odor linger about the cavity prepare a stuffing of bread crumbs butter salt and pepper fill the bodies and crops of the chickens which should be young and plump sew them up and roast an hour or more in proportion to their size baste two or three times with butter and water afterward with their own gravy if laid flat within the dripping pan put in at the first a little hot water to prevent burning stew the giblets and necks in enough water to cover them and when you have removed the fowls to a hot dish pour this into the drippings boil up once add the giblets chopped fine 
thicken with browned flour. Boil again, and send to table in a gravy boat. Serve with crabapple jelly or tomato sauce. Boiled Chickens Clean, wash, and stuff as for roasting. Baste a floured cloth around each, and put into a pot with enough boiling water to cover them well. The hot water cooks the skin at once, and prevents the escape of the juices. The broth will not be so rich as if the fowls are put on in cold water, but this is a proof that the meat will be more nutritious and better flavored. Stew very slowly for the first half hour especially. Boil an hour or more guiding yourself by size and toughness. Serve with egg or bread sauce. Fricasseed Chicken, White Clean, wash, and cut up the fowls, which need not be so tender as for roasting. Lay them in salt and water for half an hour. Put them in a pot with enough cold water to cover them, and half a pound of salt pork cut into thin strips. Cover closely, and let them heat very slowly. Then stew for over an hour, if the fowls are tender. I have used chickens for this purpose that required four hours stewing, but they were tender and good when done. Only put them on in season, and cook very slowly. If they boil fast, they toughen and shrink into uneatableness. When tender, add a chopped onion or two, parsley and pepper. Cover closely again, and, when it has heated to boiling, stir in a cupful of milk, to which have been added two beaten eggs and two tablespoons of flour. Boil up fairly. Add a great spoonful of butter. Arrange the chicken neatly in a deep chafing dish, pour the gravy over it, and serve. In this case, as in all cases where beaten egg is added to hot liquor, It is best to dip out a few spoonfuls of the latter and drop a little at a time into the egg, beating all the while, that it may heat evenly and gradually before it is put into the scalding contents of the saucepan or pot. Eggs managed in this way will not curdle, as they are apt to do if thrown suddenly into hot liquid. Fricasseed Chicken Brown Clean, wash, and cut up a pair of young chickens. Lay in clear water for half an hour. If they are old, you cannot brown them well. Put them in a saucepan with enough cold water to cover them well, and set over the fire to heat slowly. Meanwhile, cut half a pound of salt pork into strips, and fry crisp. Take them out, chop fine, and put into the pot with the chicken. Fry in the fat left in the frying pan one large onion, or two or three small ones, cut into slices. Let them brown well, and add them also to the chicken, with a quarter teaspoonful of allspice and cloves. Stew all together slowly for an hour or more, until the meat is very tender. You can test this with a fork. Take out the pieces of fowl and put in a hot dish, covering closely until the gravy is ready. Add to this a great spoonful of walnut or other dark catsup, and nearly three tablespoonfuls of browned flour, a little chopped parsley, and a glass of brown sherry. Boil up once, strain through a colander to remove the bits of pork and onion, return to the pot with the chicken, let it come to a final boil, and serve, pouring the gravy over the pieces of fowl. Broiled Chicken It is possible to render a tough fowl eatable by boiling or stewing it with care. Never broil such. And even when assured that your broiler is young, it is wise to make this doubly sure by laying it upon sticks extending from side to side of a dripping pan full of boiling water. Set this in the oven, invert a tin pan over the chicken, and let it steam for half an hour. This process relaxes the muscles, and renders supple the joints, besides preserving the juices that would be lost in parboiling. The chicken should be split down the back, and wiped perfectly clean before it is steamed. Transfer from the vapor bath to a buttered gridiron, inside downward. 
Cover with a tin pan or common plate, and broil until tender and brown, turning several times. From half to three-quarters of an hour will be sufficient. Put into a hot chafing dish and butter very well. Send to table smoking hot. Fried Chicken Number 1 Clean, wash, and cut to pieces a couple of spring chickens. Have ready in a frying pan enough boiling lard or dripping to cover them well. Dip each piece in beaten egg when you have salted it, and then in cracker crumbs, and fry until brown. If the chicken is large, steam it before frying, as directed in the foregoing recipe. When you have taken out the meat, throw into the hot fat a dozen sprigs of parsley, and let them remain a minute, just long enough to crisp, but not to dry them. Garnish the chicken by strewing these over it. Fried Chicken Number 2 Cut up half a pound of fat salt pork in a frying pan, and fry until the grease is extracted, but not until it browns. Wash and cut up a young chicken, broiling size, soak in salt and water for half an hour, wipe dry, season with pepper, and dredge with flour. Then fry in the hot fat until each piece is a rich brown on both sides. Take up, drain, and set aside in a hot covered dish. Pour into the gravy left in the frying pan a cup of milk. Half cream is better. Thicken with a spoonful of flour and a tablespoon of butter. Add some chopped parsley. Boil up and pour over the hot chicken. This is a standard dish in the Old Dominion and tastes nowhere else as it does when eaten on Virginia soil. The cream gravy is often omitted and the chicken served up dry, with bunches of fried parsley dropped upon it. Chicken Pot Pie Line the bottom and sides of a pot with a good rich paste, reserving enough for a top crust and for the square bits to be scattered through the pie. Butter the pot very lavishly, or your pastry will stick to it and burn. Cut up a fine large fowl, and half a pound of corned ham or salt pork. Put in a layer of the latter, pepper it, and cover with pieces of the chicken, and this with the paste dumplings or squares. If you use potatoes, parboil them before putting them into the pie, as the first water in which they are boiled is rank and unwholesome. The potatoes should be sliced and laid next to the pastry squares, then another layer of pork, and so on, until your chicken is used up. Cover with pastry rolled out quite thick, and slit this in the middle. Heat very slowly, and boil two hours. Turn into a large dish, the lower crust on top, and the gravy about it. This is the old-fashioned pot pie, dear to the memory of men who were schoolboys thirty and forty years ago. If you are not experienced in such manufactures, you had better omit the lower crust, and having browned the upper by putting a hot pot lid or stove cover on top of the pot for some minutes, remove dexterously without breaking. Pour out the chicken into a dish and set the crust above it. Veal, beefsteak, lamb, not mutton, hares, etc., may be substituted for the chicken. The pork will salt it sufficiently. Baked Chicken Pie Is made as above, but baked in a buttered pudding dish, and in place of the potatoes, three hard-boiled eggs are chopped up and strewed amongst the pieces of chicken. If the chickens are tough, or even doubtful, parboil them before making the pie, adding the water in which they are boiled, instead of cold water, for gravy. If they are lean, put in a few bits of butter. Ornament with leaves cut out with a cake cutter and a star in the center. Bake an hour, more if the pie is large. Chicken Pudding Cut up as for fricassee and parboil, seasoning well with pepper, salt, and a lump of butter the size of an egg, to each chicken. The fowls should be young and tender, and divided at every joint. Stew slowly for half an hour, Take them out, and lay on a flat dish to cool. Set aside the water in which they were stewed for your gravy. 
make a batter of one quart of milk, three cups of flour, three tablespoons melted butter, half a teaspoonful soda, and one spoonful of cream tartar, with four eggs well beaten and a little salt. Put a layer of chicken in the bottom of the dish and pour about half a cupful of batter over it, enough to conceal the meat, then another layer of chicken and more batter until the dish is full. The batter must form the crust. Bake one hour in a moderate oven if the dish is large. Beat up an egg and stir into the gravy which was set aside. Thicken with two teaspoonfuls of rice or wheat flour, add a little chopped parsley, boil up, and send it to table in a gravy boat. Chicken and Ham Draw, wash, and stuff a pair of young fowls. Cut enough large, thick pieces of cold-boiled ham to envelop these entirely, wrapping them up carefully and winding a string about all to prevent the ham from falling off. Put into your dripping pan with a little water to prevent scorching, dashing it over the meat lest it should dry and shrink. Invert a tin pan over all and bake slowly for one hour and a quarter if the fowls are small and tender, longer if tough. Lift the cover from time to time to baste with the drippings, the more frequently as time wears on. Test the tenderness of the fowls by sticking a fork through the ham into the breast. When done, undo the strings, lay the fowls on a hot dish and the slices of ham about them. Stir into the dripping a little chopped parsley, a tablespoon of browned flour wet in cold water, pepper, and let it boil up once. Pour some of it over the chickens, not enough to float the ham in the dish. Serve the rest in a gravy boat. Roast Ducks Clean, wash, and wipe the ducks very carefully. To the usual dressing, add a little sage, powdered or green, and a minced shallot. Stuff and sew up as usual, reserving the giblets for the gravy. If they are tender, they will not require more than an hour to roast. Baste well. Skim the gravy before putting in the giblets and thickening. The giblets should be stewed in a very little water, then chopped fine, and added to the gravy in the dripping pan, with a chopped shallot and a spoonful of browned flour. Accompany with currant or grape jelly. To use up cold duck. I may say, as preface, that cold duck is in itself an excellent supper dish, or side dish, at a family dinner, and is often preferred to hot. If the duck has been cut into at all, divide neatly into joints, and slice the breast, laying slices of dressing about it. Garnish with lettuce or parsley, and eat with jelly. But if a warm dish is desired, cut the meat from the bones and lay in a saucepan, with a little minced cold ham. Pour on just enough water to cover it, and stir in a tablespoonful of butter. Cover and heat gradually until it is near boiling. Then add the gravy, diluted with a little hot water, a great spoonful of catsup, one of Worcestershire sauce, and one of currant or cranberry jelly, with a glass of wine and a tablespoonful of browned flour. Or you may put the gravy with a little hot water and a lump of butter in a frying pan, and when it is hot, lay in the pieces of duck and warm up quickly, stirring in at the last a teaspoonful of Worcestershire sauce and a teaspoonful of jelly. Serve in a hot chafing dish. For wild ducks, see game. Stewed duck. This is a good way to treat an old tough fowl. Clean and divide as you would a chicken for fricassee. Put in a saucepan with several minced slices of cold ham or salt pork, which is not too fat, and stew slowly for at least an hour, keeping the lid on all the while. Then stir in a chopped onion, a half spoonful of powdered sage or of the green leaves cut fine, half as much parsley, a tablespoonful catsup, and black pepper. Stew another half hour, or until the duck is tender, and add a teaspoonful brown sugar and a tablespoonful of browned flour, 
previously wet with cold water. Boil up once and serve in a deep covered dish with green peas as an accompaniment. Guinea Fowls Many are not aware what an excellent article of food these speckled Arabs of the poultry yard are. They are kept chiefly for the beauty of their plumage and their delicious eggs, which are far richer than those of chickens. Unless young they are apt to be tough, and the dark color of the meat is objected to by those who are not fond of or used to eating game. Cooked according to the foregoing recipe, they are very savory, no matter how old they may be. Put them on early, and stew slowly, and good management will bring the desired end to pass. There is nothing in the shape of game or poultry that is not amenable to this process, providing the salt be omitted until the meat is tender. But a pair of young guinea fowls, stuffed and roasted, basting them with butter until they are half done, deserve an honorable place upon our bill of fare. Season the gravy with a chopped shallot, parsley, or a summer savory, not omitting the minced giblets, and thicken with browned flour. Send around currant or other tart jelly with the fowl. A little ham, minced fine, improves the dressing. Roast Goose Clean and wash the goose, not forgetting to put a spoonful of soda in next to the last water. Rinse out well and wipe the inside quite dry. Add to the usual stuffing of bread crumbs, pepper, salt, etc., a tablespoonful melted butter, an onion chopped fine, a tablespoonful chopped sage, the yolks of two eggs, and some minute bits of pork fat. Stuff body and craw and sew up. It will take fully two hours to roast if the fire is strong. Cover the breast until it is half done with white paper or a paste of flour and water, removing this when you are ready to brown. Make a gravy as for roast duck, adding a glass of sherry or Madeira, or, if you can get it, old port. Send to table with cranberry or applesauce. Goose Pie An old goose is as nearly good for nothing as it is possible for anything which was once valuable, and is not now absolutely spoiled, to be. The best use to put it to is to make it into a pie in the following manner. Put on the ancient early in the morning, in cold water enough to cover it, unsalted, having cut it to pieces at every joint. Warm it up gradually and let it stew, not boil hard, for four to five hours. Should the water need replenishing, let it be done from the boiling kettle. Parboil a beef's tongue, corned, Cut into slices nearly half an inch thick. Also slice six hard-boiled eggs. Line a deep pudding dish with a good paste. Lay in the pieces of goose, the giblets chopped, the sliced tongue and egg in consecutive layers. Season with salt, pepper, and bits of butter, and proceed in this order until the dish is full. If the goose be large, cut the meat from the bones after stewing, and leave out the latter entirely. Intersperse with strips of paste, and fill up with the gravy in which the goose was stewed, thickened with flour. Cover with a thick paste, and when it is done, brush over the top with beaten white of egg. In cold weather, this pie will keep a week, and is very good. Roast Pigeons Clean, wash, and stuff as you would chickens. Lay them in rows, if roasted in the oven, with a little water in the pan to prevent scorching. Unless they are very fat, baste with butter until they are half done, afterwards with their own gravy. Thicken the gravy that drips from them and boil up once, then pour into a gravy boat. The pigeons should lie close together in the dish. Stewed Pigeons Pick, draw, clean, and stuff as above directed. Put the pigeons in a deep pot with enough cold water to cover them, and stew gently for an hour, or until, testing them with a fork, you find them tender. Then season with pepper, salt, a few blades of mace, a little sweet marjoram, and a good piece of butter. Stew, or rather simmer, for five minutes longer, 
then stir in a tablespoonful of browned flour. Let it boil up once, remove the pigeons, draw out the strings with which they were sewed up, and serve, pouring the hot gravy over them. A little salt pork or ham, cut into strips, is an improvement. This should be put in when the pigeons have stewed half an hour. Broiled Pigeons or Squabs Young pigeons, or squabs, are rightly esteemed a great delicacy. They are cleaned, washed, and dried carefully with a clean cloth, then split down the back, and broiled like chickens. Season with pepper and salt, and butter liberally in dishing them. They are in great request in a convalescence room, being peculiarly savory and nourishing. They may, for a change, be roasted whole, according to the recipe for roast pigeons. Pigeon pie is best made of wild pigeons. See Game. End of Section 8section nine of common sense in the household this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b common sense in the household a manual of practical housewifery by marion harlan meats roast beef the best pieces for roasting are the sirloin and rib pieces the latter are oftenest used by small families make your butcher remove most of the bone and skewer the meat into the shape of a round if you roast in an oven it is a good plan to dash a small cup of boiling water over the meat in first putting it down letting it trickle into the pan this for a season checks the escape of the juices and allows the meat to get warmed through before the top dries by said escape if there is much fat upon the upper surface cover with a paste of flour and water until it is nearly done baste frequently at first with salt and water afterward with the drippings allow about a quarter of an hour to a pound if you like your meat rare more if you prefer to have it well done some when the meat is almost done dredge with flour and baste with butter only once remove the beef when quite ready to a heated dish skim the drippings add a teacupful of boiling water boil up once and send to table in a gravy boat many reject made gravy altogether and only serve the red liquor that runs from the meat into the dish as it is cut this is the practice with some indeed most of our best housekeepers if you have made gravy in a sauce boat give your guest his choice between that and the juice in the dish serve with mustard or scraped horseradish and vinegar roast beef with yorkshire pudding set a piece of beef to roast upon a grating or several sticks laid across a dripping pan three quarters of an hour before it is done mix the pudding and pour into the pan continue to roast the beef the dripping meanwhile falling upon the latter below when both are done cut the pudding into squares and lay around the meat when dished if there is much fat in the dripping pan before the pudding is ready to be put in drain it off leaving just enough to prevent the batter from sticking to the bottom receipt for pudding one pint of milk four eggs whites and yolks beaten separately two cups of prepared flour one teaspoonful salt be careful in mixing not to get the batter too stiff this pudding which the cook who introduced it into my family persisted in calling auction pudding is very palatable and popular and not so rich as would be thought from the manner of baking it should be a yellow brown when done beefsteak it is not customary to fry beefsteaks for people who know what really good cookery is to speak more plainly a steak killed by heat and swimming in grease is a culinary solecism both vulgar and indigestible cut the steak thick at least three-quarters of an inch in thickness and if you cannot get tender meat for this purpose it is best to substitute some other dish for it but since tender meat is not always to be had if the piece you have purchased is doubtful lay it on a clean cloth take a blunt heavy carving knife if you have not a steak mallet and hack closely from one end to the other 
then turn and repeat the process upon the other side the knife should be so dull you cannot cut with it and the strokes not the sixtieth part of an inch apart wipe all over on both sides with lemon juice cover and leave it in a cool place for an hour lay on a buttered gridiron over a clear fire turning very often as it begins to drip do not season until it is done which will be in about twelve minutes if the fire is good and the cook attentive rub your hot chafing dish with a split raw onion lay in the steak salt and pepper on both sides and put a liberal lump of butter upon the upper then put on a hot cover and let it stand five minutes to draw the juices to the surface before it is eaten if you have neither chafing dish nor cover lay the steak between two hot platters for the same time sending to table without uncovering a gridiron fitting under the grate is better than any other if a gridiron is not at hand rub a little butter upon the bottom of a hot clean frying pan put in the meat set over a bright fire and turn frequently this will not be equal to steak cooked upon a gridiron but it is infinitely preferable to the same fried i shall never forget the wondering distrust with which my first cook a sable professional watched me when i undertook to show her how to prepare a steak for the third breakfast over which i presided as mistress of ceremonies and when at the end of twelve minutes i removed the meat rare and hot to the heated dish in readiness her sniff of lofty contempt was as eloquent as indescribable call dat cooked folks bout here would a had dat steak on by daybreak a remark that has been recalled to my mind hundreds of times since at the tables of so-called capital housewives the best nay the only pieces for steak are those known as porterhouse and sirloin the former is the more highly esteemed by gourmands but a really tender sirloin is more serviceable where there are several persons in the family the porterhouse having a narrow strip of extremely nice meat lying next to the bone while the rest is often inferior to any part of the sirloin if the meat be tender omit the hacking process and lemon juice beef steak and onions prepare the steak as above directed while it is broiling put three or four chopped onions in a frying pan with a little beef dripping or butter stir and shake them briskly until they are done and begin to brown dish your steak and lay the onions thickly on top cover and let all stand five or six minutes that the hot onions may impart the required flavor to the hot meat in helping your guests inquire if they will take onions with the slices of steak put upon their plates i need hardly remind the sensible cook how necessary it is to withdraw the gridiron from the fire for an instant should the fat drip upon the coals below and smoke or blaze yet those who have eaten steaks flavored with creosote may thank me for the suggestion beef a la mode take a round of beef remove the bone from the middle and trim away the tougher bits around the edges with such gristle etc as you can reach set these aside for soup stock bind the beef into a symmetrical shape by passing a strip of stout muslin as wide as the round is high about it and stitching the ends together at one side have ready at least a pound of fat salt pork cut into strips as thick as your middle finger and long enough to reach from top to bottom of the trussed round put a half pint of vinegar over the fire in a tin or porcelain saucepan season with three or four minced shallots or button onions two teaspoonfuls made mustard a teaspoonful nutmeg one of cloves half as much allspice half spoonful black pepper with a bunch of sweet herbs minced fine and a tablespoonful brown sugar let all simmer for five minutes then boil up once and pour while scalding hot upon the strips of pork which should be laid in a deep dish let all stand together until cold remove the pork to a plate and mix with the liquor left in the dish enough bread crumbs to make a tolerably stiff force meat if the vinegar is very strong dilute with a little water before moistening the crumbs with a long thin bladed knife make perpendicular incisions in the meat not more than half an inch apart even nearer is better thrust into these the strips of fat pork so far down that the upper ends are just level with the surface and work into the cavities with them 
a little of the force meat proceed thus until the meat is fairly riddled and plugged with the pork fill the hole from which the bone was taken with the dressing and bits of pork rub the upper side of the beef well with the spiced force meat put into a baking pan half fill this with boiling water turn a large pan over it to keep in the steam and roast slowly for five or six hours allowing half an hour to each pound of meat if the meat be tough you had better stew the round by putting it in a pot with half enough cold water to cover it cover tightly and stew very slowly for six hours then set in the oven with the gravy about it and brown half an hour basting frequently if you roast the round do not remove the cover except to baste and this should be done often until fifteen minutes before you draw it from the oven set away with the muslin band still about it and pour the gravy over the meat when cold lift from the gravy which by the way will be excellent seasoning for your soup stock cut the stitches in the muslin girdle remove carefully and send the meat to table cold garnish with parsley and nasturtium blossoms carve horizontally in slices thin as a shaving do not offer the outside to any one but the second cut will be handsomely marbled with the white pork which appearance should continue all the way down i cannot too highly commend this as a side dish at dinner and a supper and breakfast standby in winter it will keep a week or more and as long in summer if kept in the refrigerator except when it is on the table breakfast stew of beef cut up two pounds of beef not too lean into pieces an inch long put them into a saucepan with just enough water to cover them and stew gently for two hours set away until next morning when seasoned with pepper salt sweet marjoram or summer savory chopped onion and parsley stew half an hour longer and add a teaspoonful of sauce or ketchup and a tablespoonful of brown flour wet up with cold water finally if you wish to have it very good half a glass of wine boil up once and pour into a covered deep dish this is an economical dish for it can be made of the commoner parts of the beef and exceedingly nice for winter breakfasts eaten with corn bread and stewed potatoes it will soon win its way to a place in the stock company of every judicious housewife another breakfast dish cut thin slices of cold roast beef and lay them in a tin saucepan set in a pot of boiling water cover them with a gravy made of three tablespoonfuls of melted butter one of walnut ketchup a teaspoonful of vinegar a little salt and pepper a spoonful of currant jelly a teaspoonful made mustard and some warm water cover tightly and steam for half an hour keeping the water in the outer vessel on a hard boil if the meat is underdone this is particularly nice beef hash to two parts cold roast or boiled corned beef chopped fine put one of mashed potatoes a little pepper salt milk and melted butter turn all into a frying pan and stir until it is heated through and smoking hot but not until it browns put into a deep dish and if stiff enough smooth as you would mashed potato into a hillock or you can cease stirring for a few minutes and let a brown crust form on the under side then turn out whole into a flat dish the brown side uppermost or mold the mixture into flat cakes dip these in beaten egg flour and fry in hot drippings the remains of beef a la mode are very good prepared in any of these ways a little ketchup and mustard are an improvement to plain cold beef thus hashed beef steak pie cut the steak into pieces an inch long and stew with the bone cracked in just enough water to cover the meat until it is half done at the same time parboil a dozen potatoes in another pot if you wish a bottom crust a doubtful question line a pudding dish with a good paste made according to the receipt given below put in a layer of the beef with salt and pepper and a very little chopped onion then one of sliced potatoes with a little butter scattered upon them and so on until the dish is full pour over all the gravy in which the meat is stewed having first thrown away the bone and thickened with brown flour cover with the crust thicker than the lower leaving a slit in the middle crust for meat pies one quart of flour three tablespoonfuls of lard two and a half cups milk one teaspoonful of soda 
wet with hot water and stirred into the milk two teaspoonfuls of cream tartar sifted into the dry flour one teaspoonful of salt work up very lightly and quickly and do not get stiff if you can get prepared flour omit the soda and cream tartar beef pie with potato crust mince some rare roast beef or cold corned beef if it is not too salt season with pepper and salt and spread a layer in the bottom of a pudding dish over this put one of mashed potato and stick bits of butter thickly all over it then another of meat and so on until you are ready for the crust to a large cupful of mashed potato add two tablespoonfuls of melted butter a well-beaten egg two cups of milk and beat all together until very light then work in enough flour to enable you to roll out in a sheet not too stiff and when you have added to the meat and potato in the dish a gravy made of warm water butter milk and ketchup with what cold gravy or dripping remains from roast cover the pie with a thick tender crust cutting a slit in the middle you can use the potato crust which is very wholesome and good for any kind of meat pie it looks well brushed over with beaten white of egg before it goes to table beef's heart stewed wash the heart well and cut into squares half an inch long stew them for ten minutes in enough water to cover them salt the water slightly to draw out the blood and throw it away as it rises in scum to the top take out the meat strain the liquor and return the chopped heart to it with a sliced onion a great spoonful of ketchup some parsley a head of celery chopped fine and cayenne pepper with a large lump of butter stew until the meat is very tender when add a tablespoonful of brown flour to thicken boil up once and serve to corn beef rub each piece of beef well with salt mixed with one tenth part of saltpetre until the salt lies dry upon the surface put aside in a cold place for twenty-four hours and repeat the process rubbing in the mixture very thoroughly put away again until the next day by which time the pickle should be ready five gallons of water one gallon of salt four ounces saltpetre one and one half pound brown sugar boil this brine ten minutes let it get perfectly cold then pour over the beef having wiped the latter entirely dry examine the pickle from time to time to see if it keeps well if not take out the meat without delay wipe it and rub in dry salt covering it well until you can prepare new and stronger brine boiled corned beef if your piece is around skewer it well into shape and tie it up with stout tape or twine when you have washed it in three or four waters and removed all the salt from the outside put into a pot and cover with cold water allow in boiling about twenty minutes to a pound turn the meat three times while cooking when done drain very dry and serve with drawn butter in a sauce boat send around mashed turnips with the meat they should be boiled in a separate pot however or they will impart a disagreeable taste to the beef the brisket is a good piece for a family dinner beef tongue soak overnight in cold water when you have washed it well next morning put into a pot with plenty of cold water and boil slowly until it is tender throughout this you can determine by testing it with a fork leave in the liquor until quite cold pare off the thick skin cut in round slices and dish for tea garnishing with fresh parsley tongue sandwiches are generally held in higher esteem than those made of ham dried beef the most common way of serving dried or smoked beef is to shave it into thin slices or chips raw but a more savory relish may be made of it with little trouble put the slices of uncooked beef into a frying pan with just enough boiling water to cover them set them over the fire for ten minutes drain off all the water and with a knife and fork cut the meat into small bits return to the pan which should be hot with a tablespoonful of butter and a little pepper have ready some well-beaten eggs allowing four to a half pound of beef stir them into the pan with the minced meat and toss and stir the mixture for about two minutes send to table in a covered dish end of section nine section ten of common sense in the household this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain 
For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by phone. Common Sense in the Household, A Manual of Practical Housewifery by Marion Harland. Mutton and Lamb. Roast Mutton. The parts which are usually roasted are the shoulder, the saddle or chine, and the loin and haunch, a leg and part of the loin. The leg is best boiled, unless the mutton is young and very tender. To roast, wash the meat well and dry with a clean cloth. Let your fire be clear and strong. Put the meat on with a little water in the dripping pan. If you think well of the plan, and I do, let there be a cupful of boiling water dashed over the meat when it is first put down to roast, and left to trickle into the pan. I have elsewhere explained the advantages of the method. Allow, in roasting, about twelve minutes per pound, if the fire is good. Baste often, at first with salt and water, afterward with the gravy. If it is in danger of browning too fast, cover with a large sheet of white paper. Roast lamb in the same manner, but not so long. Skim the gravy well, and thicken very slightly with brown flour. Serve with currant jelly. Roast Mutton à la Vénison A Christmas saddle of mutton is very fine prepared as follows. Wash it well, inside and out, with vinegar. Do not wipe it, but hang it up to dry in a cool cellar. When the vinegar has dried off, throw a clean cloth over it to keep out the dust. On the next day but one, take down the meat and sponge it over again with vinegar, then put it back in its place in the cellar. Repeat this process three times a week for a fortnight, keeping the meat hung in a cold place and covered, except while you are washing it. When you are ready to cook it, wipe it off with a dry cloth, but do not wash it. Roast, basting for the first hour with butter and water, afterwards with the gravy, and keeping the meat covered with a large tin pan for two hours. A large saddle of mutton will require four hours to roast. When it is done, remove to a dish and cover to keep it hot. Skim the gravy and add half a teacupful of walnut, mushroom or tomato catsup, a glass of Madeira wine and a tablespoonful of brown flour. Boil up once and send to table in a sauce boat. Always send around currant or some other tart jelly with roast mutton. If properly cooked, a saddle of mutton prepared in accordance with these directions will strongly resemble venison in taste. An old Virginia gentleman whom I used to know always hung up the finest saddle his plantation could furnish six weeks before Christmas, and had it sponged off with vinegar every other day until the morning of the important 25th, and the excellence of his mutton was the talk of the neighborhood. It can certainly be kept a fortnight anywhere at that season. Boiled Mutton Wash a leg of mutton clean and wipe dry. Do not leave the knuckle and shank so long as to be unshapely. Put into a pot with hot water, salted, enough to cover it, and boil until you ascertain by probing with a fork that it is tender in the thickest part. Skim off all the scum as it rises. Allow about twelve minutes to each pound. Take from the fire, drain perfectly dry, and serve with melted butter, with capers, or nasturtium seed. Or, if you have neither of these, some cucumber or gherkin pickles stirred into it. If you wish to use the broth for soup, put in very little salt while boiling. If not, salt well, and boil the meat in a cloth. Mutton Stew Cut up from three to four pounds of mutton, the inferior portions will do as well as any other. Crack the bones and remove all the fat. Put on the meat. The pieces not more than an inch and a half in length in a pot with enough cold water to cover well and set it where it will heat gradually add nothing else until it has stewed an hour closely covered then throw in half a pound of salt pork cut into strips a little chopped onion and some pepper cover and stew an hour longer or until the meat is very tender make out a little paste as for the crust of a meat pie 
cut into squares and drop in the stew boil ten minutes and season further by the addition of a little parsley and thyme thicken with two spoonfuls of flour stirred into a cup of hot milk boil up once and serve in a tureen or deep covered dish if green corn is in season the stew is greatly improved by adding an hour before it is taken from the fire the grains of half a dozen ears cut from the cob try it for a cheap family dinner and you will repeat the experiment often lamb is even better for your purpose than mutton mutton chops if your butcher has not done it and the chances are that he has not unless you stood by to see it attended to trim off the superfluous fat and skin so as to give the chops a certain litheness and elegance of shape dip each in beaten egg roll in pounded cracker and fry in hot lard or dripping if the fat is unsalted sprinkle the chops with salt before rolling in the egg serve up dry and hot or you may omit the egg and cracker and broil on a gridiron over a bright fire put a little salt and pepper upon each chop and butter them before they go to table cook lamb chops in the same way mutton cutlets baked cut them from the neck and trim neatly lay aside the bits of bone and meat you cut off to make gravy pour a little melted butter over the cutlets and let them lie in it for fifteen minutes keeping them just warm enough to prevent the butter from hardening then dip each in beaten egg roll in cracker crumbs and lay them in your dripping pan with a very little water at the bottom bake quickly and baste often with butter and water put on the bones etc in enough cold water to cover them stew and season with sweet herbs pepper and salt with a spoonful of tomato catsup strain when all the substance is extracted from the meat and bones thicken with brown flour and pour over the cutlets when they are served mutton ham for a leg of mutton weighing twelve pounds take one ounce of black pepper or a quarter ounce of cayenne a quarter pound brown sugar one ounce saltpetre and one and a quarter pound salt the day after the sheep is killed mix the sugar pepper and saltpetre and rub well into the meat for nearly fifteen minutes until the outer part of it is thoroughly impregnated with the seasoning Put the ham into a large earthenware vessel and cover it with the salt. Let it remain thus for three weeks, turning it every day and basting it with the brine. Adding to this, after the first week, a teacupful of vinegar. When the ham is removed from the pickle, wash with cold water, then with vinegar, and hang it up in a cool cellar for a week at least before it is used. Soak an hour in fair water before boiling or if you choose to smoke it for several days after it is corned it can be chipped and eaten raw like jerked venison or dried beef most of the receipts above given will apply as well to lamb as to mutton there are several exceptions however which you will do well to note lamb should never be boiled except in stews it is tasteless and sodden cooked in this manner on account of its immaturity but on the other hand a lamb pie prepared like one of beef and venison is excellent while mutton pies have usually a strong tallowy taste that spoils them for delicate palates roast lamb should be eaten with mint sauce if you fancy it currant jelly and asparagus or green peas lettuce salad is likewise a desirable accompaniment mutton or lamb réchauffé cut some slices of cold underdone mutton or lamb put them in a frying pan with enough gravy or broth to cover them or if you have neither of them make a gravy of butter warm water and catsup heat to boiling and stir in pepper and a great spoonful of currant jelly send to table in a chafing dish with the gravy poured about to meat or you can put a lump of the butter in the bottom of the pan and when it boils lay in the slices of meat turning them before they have time to crisp as soon as they are thoroughly heated take them out lay upon a hot dish sprinkle with pepper and salt and serve with a small spoonful of jelly laid upon each end of section ten
Recording by phone. Section 11 of Common Sense in the Household. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Common Sense in the Household, a Manual of Practical Housewifery by Marion Harlan. Veal. Despite the prejudice, secret or expressed, which prevails in many minds against veal, one which the wise and witty country parson has as surely fostered among reading people as did charles lamb the partiality for roast pig the excellent and attractive dishes that own this as their base are almost beyond number for soups it is invaluable and in entrees and rechauffes it plays a distinguished part from his head to his feet the animal that furnishes us with this important element of success in what should be the prime object of cookery to wit to please while we nourish has proved himself so useful as an ally that it behooves us to lift the stigma from the name of calf provided he be not too infantine in that case he degenerates into an insipid mass of pulpy muscle and gelatin and deserves the bitterest sneers that have been flung at his kind roast veal loin veal requires a longer time to roast than mutton or lamb it is fair to allow at least a quarter of an hour to each pound heat gradually baste frequently at first with salt and water afterward with gravy when the meat is nearly done dredge lightly with flour and baste once with melted butter skim the gravy thicken with a tablespoonful of flour boil up and put into the gravy boat should the meat brown too fast cover with white paper the juices which make up the characteristic flavor of meat are oftener dried out of veal than any other flesh that comes to our tables breast make incisions between the ribs and the meat and fill with a force meat made of fine bread crumbs bits of pork or ham chopped exceedingly small salt pepper thyme sweet marjoram and beaten egg save a little to thicken the gravy roast slowly basting often and the verdict of the eaters will differ from theirs who pronounce this the coarsest part of the veal dredge at the last with flour and baste well once with butter as with the loin fillet make ready a dressing of bread crumbs chopped thyme and parsley a little nutmeg pepper and salt rub together with some melted butter or beef suet moisten with milk or hot water and bind with a beaten egg take out the bone from the meat and pin securely into a round with skewers then pass a stout twine several times about the fillet or a band of muslin fill the cavity from which the bone was taken with this stuffing and thrust between the folds of the meat besides making incisions with a thin sharp knife to receive it once in a while slip in a strip of fat pork or ham baste it first with salt and water afterward with gravy at the last dredge with flour and baste with butter shoulder stuff as above making horizontal incisions near the bone to receive the dressing and roast in like manner veal cutlets dip in beaten egg when you have sprinkled a little pepper and salt over them then roll in cracker crumbs and fry in hot dripping or lard if you use butter or dripping add a little boiling water to the gravy when the meat is dished thicken with brown flour boil up once sending to table in a boat or you can rub the cutlets well with melted butter pepper and broil on a gridiron like beefsteak buttering very well after dishing veal chops are more juicy and less apt to be tough and solid than cutlets trim the bone as with mutton chops and fry dipping in beaten egg and cracker crumbs add a little parsley and a minced shallot to the gravy veal steak this should be thinner than beefsteak and be done throughout few persons are fond of rare veal broil upon a well-greased gridiron over a clear fire and turn frequently while the steaks are cooking put into a saucepan four or five young onions minced fine a great teaspoonful of tomato ketchup or twice the quantity of stewed tomato a lump of butter the size of an egg and a little thyme or parsley with a small teacupful of hot water let them stew together while the steaks are broiling 
thickening before you turn the gravy out with a spoonful of browned flour add if you please a half glass of wine boil up once hard and when the steaks are dished with a small bit of butter upon each pour the mixture over and around them spinach is as natural an accompaniment to veal as are green peas to lamb veal pies let your veal be juicy and not too fat take out all the bone and put with the fat and refuse bits such as skin or gristle in a saucepan with a large teacup full of cold water to make gravy instead of chopping the veal cut in thin even slices line a pudding dish with a good paste and put a layer of veal in the bottom then one of hard-boiled eggs sliced each piece buttered and peppered before it is laid upon the veal cover these with sliced ham or thin strips of salt pork squeeze a few drops of lemon juice upon the ham then another layer of veal and so on until you are ready for the gravy this should have been stewing for half an hour or so with the addition of pepper and a bunch of aromatic herbs strain through a thin cloth and pour over the pie cover with crust and bake two hours or butter a large bowl very thickly and line with sliced hard-boiled eggs then put in in perpendicular layers a lining of veal cut in thin slices and seasoned with pepper next one of sliced ham each slice peppered and sprinkled with lemon juice more veal and more ham until the dish is packed to the brim cover with a thick paste made of flour and hot water just stiff enough to handle with ease press this closely to the outside of the bowl which should not be at all greasy let it overlap the rim about half an inch some cooks substitute a cloth well floured but it does not keep in the essence of the meats as well as the paste set the bowl in a pot of hot water not so deep that it will bubble over the top it is better that it should not touch the paste rim boil steadily not hard for at least three hours remove the paste the next day when bowl and contents are perfectly cold and turn out the pie into a large plate or flat dish cut in circular slices thin as a wafer beginning at the top keeping your carver horizontal and you have a delicious relish for the supper table or side dish for dinner set in a cool place and in winter it will keep several days this is the wheel and hammer pie endorsed by mr wegg as a good thing for mellering the organ and is a great favorite in england it is a good plan to butter the eggs as well as the dish as much of the success of the pie depends upon the manner in which it is turned out also upon the close packing of the sliced meat the salt ham prevents the need of other salt stewed fillet of veal stuff and bind with twine as for roasting then cover the top and sides with sliced ham which has been already boiled securing with skewers or twine crossing the meat in all directions lay in a pot put in two large cups of boiling water cover immediately and closely and stew gently never letting it cease to boil yet never boiling hard for four or five hours a large fillet will require nearly five hours remove the cover as seldom as possible and only to ascertain whether the water has boiled away if it is too low replenish from the boiling kettle take off the strings when the meat is done arrange the ham about the fillet in the dish and serve a bit with each slice of veal strain the gravy thicken with flour boil up once and send in a boat serve with stewed tomatoes and spinach stewed knuckle of veal put the meat into a pot with two quarts of boiling water half a pound of salt pork or ham cut into strips a carrot two onions a bunch of parsley and one of summer savory all cut fine two dozen whole peppercorns and stew closely covered for three hours when done take the meat from the pot and lay in the dish strain the gravy thicken with rice flour boil up once and pour over the meat veal scallop chop some cold roast or stewed veal very fine put a layer in the bottom of a buttered pudding dish and season with pepper and salt next have a layer of finely powdered crackers strew some bits of butter upon it and wet with a little milk then more veal seasoned as before and another round of cracker crumbs with butter and milk when the dish is full wet well with gravy or broth diluted with warm water spread over all a thick layer of cracker seasoned with salt wet into a paste with milk 
and bound with a beaten egg or two if the dish be large stick butter bits thickly over it invert a tin pan so as to cover all and keep in the steam and bake if small half an hour three quarters will suffice for a large dish remove the cover ten minutes before it is served and brown this simple and economical dish should be an acquaintance with all who are fond of veal in any shape children generally like it exceedingly and i have heard more than one gentleman of excellent judgment in culinary affairs declare that the best thing he knew about roast veal was that it was the harbinger of scallop on the second day try it and do not get it too dry veal pates mince the veal as above and roll three or four crackers to powder also chop up some cold ham and mix with the veal in the proportion of one-third ham and two-thirds veal then add the cracker and wet well with gravy and a little milk if you have no gravy stir into a cup of hot milk two tablespoonfuls of butter and a beaten egg season well to your taste and bake in pate pans lined with puff paste if eaten hot send to table in the tins if cold slip the pates out and pile upon a plate with sprigs of parsley between a little oyster liquor is a marked improvement to the gravy stewed calf's head wash the head in several waters and taking out the brains set them by in a cool place tie the head in a floured cloth and boil it two hours in hot water slightly salted wash the brains carefully picking out all the bits of skin and membrane cleansing them over and over until they are perfectly white then stew in just enough water to cover them take them out mash smooth with the back of a wooden spoon and add gradually that it may not lump a small teacupful of the water in which the head is boiled season with chopped parsley a pinch of sage pepper salt and powdered cloves with a great spoonful of butter set it over the fire to simmer in a saucepan until you are ready when the head is tender take it up and drain very dry score the top and rub it well over with melted butter dredge with flour and set in the oven to brown or you can use beaten egg and cracker crumbs in place of the butter and flour when you serve the head pour the gravy over it never skin a calf's head scald as you would that of a pig a little lye in the water will remove the hair as will also pounded rosin applied before it is put into the water calf's head scalloped clean the head remove the brains and set in a cool place boil the head until the meat slips easily from the bones take it out and chop fine season with herbs pepper and salt then put in layers into a buttered pudding dish with bits of butter between each layer moisten well with the liquor in which the head was boiled wash the brains very thoroughly removing all the membrane beat them into a smooth paste season with pepper and salt and stir in with them two eggs beaten very light spread this evenly over the scallop dredge the top with a little flour and bake to a delicate brown half an hour will be long enough sweetbreads fried wash very carefully and dry with a linen cloth lard with narrow strips of fat salt pork set closely together use for this purpose a larding needle lay the sweetbreads in a clean hot frying pan which has been well buttered or greased and cooked to a fine brown turning frequently until the pork is crisp sweetbreads broiled parboil rub them well with butter and broil on a clean gridiron turn frequently and now and then roll over in a plate containing some hot melted butter this will prevent them from getting too dry and hard sweetbreads stewed when you have washed them and removed all bits of skin and fatty matter cover with cold water and heat to a boil pour off the hot water and cover with cold until the sweetbreads are firm if you desire to have them very rich lard as for frying before you put them in the second water they are more delicate however if the pork be left out stew in a very little water the second time when they are tender add for each sweetbread a heaping teaspoonful of butter and a little chopped parsley with pepper and salt and a little cream let them simmer in this gravy for five minutes then take them up send to a table in a covered dish with the gravy poured over them if you lard the sweetbread substitute for the cream in the gravy a glass of good wine in this case take the sweetbreads out before it is put into the gravy boil up once and pour over them 
sweetbreads roasted parboil and throw into cold water where let them stand for fifteen minutes then change to more cold water for five minutes longer wipe perfectly dry lay them in your dripping pan and roast basting with butter and water until they begin to brown then withdraw them for an instant roll in beaten egg then in cracker crumbs and return to the fire for ten minutes longer basting meanwhile twice with melted butter lay in a chafing dish while you add to the dripping half a cup hot water some chopped parsley a teaspoonful brown flour and the juice of half a lemon pour over the sweetbreads before sending to table jellied veal wash a knuckle of veal and cut into three pieces boil it slowly until the meat will slip easily from the bones take out of the liquor remove all the bones and chop the meat fine season with salt pepper two shallots chopped as fine as possible mace and thyme or if you like sage put back into the liquor and boil until it is almost dry and can be stirred with difficulty turn into a mold until next day set on the table cold garnish with parsley and cut in slices the juice of a lemon stirred in just before it is taken from the fire is an improvement calf's head in a mold boil a calf's head until tender the day before you wish to use it when perfectly cold chop not too small and season to taste with pepper salt mace and the juice of a lemon prepare half as much cold ham fat and lean also minced as you have of the chopped calf's head butter a mould well and lay in the bottom a layer of the calf's head then one of ham and so on until the shape is full pressing each layer hard when you have moistened it with veal gravy or the liquor in which the head was boiled pour more gravy over the top and when it is soaked in well cover with a paste made of flour and water bake one hour remove the paste when it is quite cold and turn out carefully cut perpendicularly this is quite as good a relish when made of cold roast or stewed veal and ham it will keep several days in cool weather veal olives with oysters cut large smooth slices from a fillet of veal or veal chops will do quite as well trim them into a uniform shape and size and spread each neatly with forced meat made of bread crumbs and a little chopped pork season with pepper and salt over this spread some chopped oysters about three to a good sized slice of veal roll them up carefully and closely and pin each with two small tin or wooden skewers lay them in a dripping pan dash a teacupful of boiling water over them and roast basting at least twice with melted butter when they are brown remove to a chafing dish and cover while you add a little oyster liquor to the gravy left in the dripping pan let this simmer for three or four minutes thicken with a teaspoonful of browned flour and boil up at once withdraw the skewers cautiously so as not to break the olives pour the gravy over and around them and serve if you have no skewers bind the olives with pack thread cutting it of course before sending to table serve with cranberry jelly minced veal take the remains of a cold roast of veal fillet shoulder or breast and cut all the meat from the bones put the latter with the outside slices and the gristly pieces into a saucepan with a cup of cold water some sweet herbs pepper and salt if you have a bit of bacon convenient or a ham bone add this and omit the salt stew all together for an hour then strain thicken with flour return to the fire and boil five minutes longer stirring in a tablespoonful of butter meanwhile mince the cold veal and when the gravy is ready put this in a little at a time let it almost boil when add two tablespoonfuls of cream or three of milk stirring all the while lastly squeeze in the juice of a lemon and a moment later half a glass of sherry or madeira wine the mincemeat should be dry enough to heap into a shape in a flat dish or chafing dish lay triangles of buttered toast about the base of the mound and on the top a poached egg the remains of cold roast beef treated in this manner substituting for the toast balls of mashed potato will make a neat and palatable dish send around spinach or stewed tomatoes with minced veal scraped horseradish steeped in vinegar with the beef veal cutlets a la maintenon the cutlets should be nearly three-quarters of an inch thick and trim in shape dip each in beaten egg then into pounded cracker 
which has been seasoned with powdered sweet herbs pepper and salt wrap each cutlet in a half sheet of note or letter paper well buttered lay them upon a buttered gridiron and broil over a clear fire turning often and dexterously you can secure the papers by fringing the ends and twisting these after the cutlets are put in this is neater than to pin them together in trying this dish for the first time have ready a sufficient number of duplicate papers in a clean hot dish if your envelopes are much soiled or darkened while the cutlets are broiling transfer quickly when done to the clean warm ones twist the ends and serve cutlets prepared in this manner are sent to table in their cloaks ranged symmetrically upon a hot chafing dish the expedient of the clean papers is a trick of the trade amateur housewives will observe with satisfaction epicures profess to enjoy veal cooked in covers far more than when the flavor and juices escape in broiling without them empty every drop of gravy from the soiled papers into the clean over the cutlets croquettes of calves brains wash the brains very thoroughly until they are free from membranous matter and perfectly white beat them smooth season with a pinch of powdered sage pepper and salt add two tablespoonfuls fine bread crumbs moistened with milk and a beaten egg roll into balls with floured hands dip in beaten egg then cracker crumbs and fry in butter or veal drippings these make a pleasant accompaniment to boiled spinach heap the vegetable in the centre of the dish arrange the balls about it and give one to each person who wishes spinach calves liver roasted soak the liver in salt and water an hour to draw out the blood wipe perfectly dry and stuff with a force meat made of bread crumbs two slices of fat salt pork chopped small a shallot pepper salt and nutmeg sweet marjoram and thyme and if you choose a little sage moisten this with butter melted in a very little hot water and two raw eggs well beaten in order to get this into the liver make an incision with a narrow sharp knife and without enlarging the aperture where the blade entered move the point dexterously to and fro to enlarge the cavity inside stuff this full of the force meat sew or skewer up the outer orifice lard with strips of salt pork and roast for an hour basting twice with butter and water afterward with the gravy in the dripping pan pour the gravy over the liver when done roasted liver is very good cold cut into slices like tongue calves liver fried slice the liver smoothly and lay in salt and water to draw out the blood lard each slice when you have wiped it dry with slices of fat salt pork drawn through at regular distances and projecting slightly on each side lay in a clean frying pan and fry brown when done take out the slices arrange them neatly on a hot dish and set aside to keep warm add to the gravy in the frying pan a chopped onion a half cup of hot water pepper the juice of a lemon and thicken with brown flour boil up well run through a colander to remove the onion and the bits of crisp pork that may have been broken off in cooking pour over the liver and serve hot pigs livers can be cooked in the same way calves liver stewed slice the liver and lay in salt and water an hour then cut into dice and put over the fire with enough cold water to cover it well cover and stew steadily for an hour when add salt pepper a little mace sweet marjoram parsley and a teaspoonful worcestershire sauce stew again steadily not fast for half an hour longer when put in a tablespoonful of butter two of brown flour wet with cold water a teaspoonful of lemon juice and one of currant jelly boil five minutes longer and dish a little wine is an improvement or put in with the liver dice some of salt pork say a handful and when you season a chopped onion and omit the jelly at the last substituting some tomato ketchup imitation pate de foie gras boil a calf's liver until very tender in water that has been slightly salted and in another vessel a nice calf's tongue it is best to do this the day before you make your pate as they should be not only cold but firm when used cut the liver into bits and rub these gradually to a smooth paste in a wedgewood mortar moistening as you go on with melted butter work into this paste which should be quite soft a quarter teaspoonful of cayenne pepper 
or twice the quantity of white or black half a grated nutmeg a little cloves a teaspoonful of worcestershire sauce salt to taste a full teaspoonful of made mustard and a tablespoonful of boiling water in which a minced onion has been steeped until the flavor is extracted work all together thoroughly and pack in jelly jars with air-tight covers or if you have them in pate jars they give a foreign air to the compound and aid imagination in deceiving the palate butter the inside of the jars well and pack the pate very hard inserting here and there square and triangular bits of the tongue which should be pared and cut up for this purpose these simulate the truffles embedded in the genuine pates from strasbourg when the jar is packed and smooth as marble on the surface cover with melted butter let this harden put on the lid and set away in a cool place in winter it will keep for weeks and is very nice for luncheon or tea make into sandwiches or set on in the jars if they are neat and ornamental the resemblance in taste to the real pate de foie gras is remarkable and the domestic article is popular with the lovers of that delicacy pig's livers make a very fair pate if you can procure the livers of several fowls and treat as above substituting bits of the inside of the gizzard for truffles you will find the result even more satisfactory veal marble boil a beef tongue the day before it is to be used and a like number of pounds of lean veal grind first one then the other in a sausage cutter keeping them in separate vessels until you are ready to pack if you have no machine for this purpose chop very fine season the tongue with pepper powdered sweet herbs a teaspoonful of made mustard a little nutmeg and cloves just a pinch of each the veal in like manner with the addition of salt pack in alternate spoonfuls as irregularly as possible in cups bowls or jars which have been well buttered press very hard as you go on smooth the top and cover with melted butter when this cools close the cans and keep in a cool dry place turn out whole or cut in slices for tea it is a pretty and savory relish garnished with parsley or the blanched tops of celery you can use ground ham instead of tongue it is hardly so good but is more economical end of section eleven